one minute to the show. Yeah, I, the meal you made me last night for our anniversary was exceptional. And had our anniversary actually fallen on the night of the show, I would have said something about it, but I'm not going to do that. You know, we don't have to leave until like 9 o'clock, 9.30 on Saturday morning for the, for the NorCal reunion. Because I don't need to be there before noon. And I'm only taking one bike. So it's sold out. Golf, mountain biking, it's sold out. A dinner. But anybody that was interested could still go to the bike show, which I think starts at 2 o'clock. It's between 2 and 4, something like that. So they can still go to the bike show. No, we'll announce, yeah, for the random share giveaway, you'll hear what I'm, what I'm doing when I do the show. Mm -hmm. All right. After the show. You're live. We're down at the starting line, sponsored by Motion Pro. I'm going to tell you what you're going to see on tonight's episode. And the next time, try this segment. We've got some tips on you on how to clean out your throttle. General maintenance, you're going to really like this. In the Moto Showcase, something very different from the International Motocross Museum. I'm looking forward to bringing you that. Here's the problem. All of your questions that came in last week, well, we've got answers for them this week. What's it worth? An OSA in a champion frame. High-priced bike. Where do you see this? It's coming up. We've got that and a whole lot more coming up on Vintage Motocross Q&A. Hey, You're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A, and I'm your host, Joe Obadi. Thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you, Jordan, Chelsea, and Susie, for helping me put the show together. And thank you, the viewers at home who join us every week. Let's take a look at what we're going to see on the show tonight. Oh, first of all, you got to share the show. Keep sharing the show, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, comment Amsoil. I'm... I'm sorry. Comment Motion Pro. Comment Motion Pro if you're watching on YouTube. And we're going to have a random share giveaway winner a little bit later on. We will announce that on the page tomorrow. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's growing. It's going really well. But if you subscribe, you'll get a little alert just like this. It tells you when we're live on YouTube. And all of our shows there, all the past shows, all of our interviews as well. So please, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tell a friend about it. And to make it a little bit more interesting... We've got a really, really great special going on. Racer X and VMX Magazine have both jumped into the show, and we're going to be giving away a subscription to each of those magazines, a one-year subscription to Racer X and VMX. The winner will be announced on the last show in October. I think that's around Wednesday the 27th. But keep subscribing to our YouTube channel. Somebody's going to get a free subscription to VMX and to Racer X. How are the pros watching the show? How are the experts doing it? They're watching it on their big screen TV in HD while they comment from their phone. That's how the pros are doing it. It's a great way to watch the show. You can see it on your big screen. You can comment and not miss anything and get in uh, all your comments there too. So please keep doing that. We really enjoy seeing your comments. Speaking of your comments, not only do we like that, but we love getting your questions and we love when you send in vintage motocross uh, showcase bikes and uh, as well as some tips or maybe you want to cover some races. Either way, contact me. I'd love to see some of the content that you have and some of the things that you'd like to share on the show or tell me what you'd like to see and we'll try and bring it to you on some future episodes. 
I want to thank our sponsors, Motion Pro, Vinco, Racer X Magazine, Golden Products, Preston Petty Products, Sunrise Vapor Blasting, Northwest Mako CZ, and Full Circle Racing. The next time try this segment is brought to you by Vinco. Tonight I want to talk to you about throttle maintenance and a couple of things to look out for when you're working on your bike, cleaning things up. Here's the first thing we're going to talk about is the throttle tube. Now we've all been there. You have an old bike, you buy it, it comes with a tube like this, you want to make sure you replace it. A lot of times, maybe you take a spill and it'll wear out like this on the end. It could bind on the bar. You may want to replace that throttle. Now, even before that, there's something else I want to talk to you about. We'll talk about also why this is sanded. But first, here's a throttle tube that looks pretty good. But what happens is when people mount them on the handlebar, they put it so far down that the end of the bar begins to wear through the tube. And you're going to eventually have a worn out tube or it's going to wind up sticking around the edge. So look for those things on your throttle tube. That's number one. Number two, as you can see here, I have sanded down this section of the handlebar. Why? Because it's a little bit thicker due to paint, not so much for anodizing, but if you're running a set of painted bars, take some sandpaper and run it along where that tube is going to be sitting. This way it spins a lot more freely on there when you get it all together. What else should we be looking out for today? The throttle housing itself these two pieces, okay? You want to make sure that they're really, really clean inside. So take them apart, take a little brake clean like this, or maybe you have a parts washer, but brake clean will work fine. Then get in there with a screwdriver, with, with a paper towel on the end, or, or some rags, whatever it may be, and you can get in there and clean out all of the old lubricant that is in there, part of the cable may have frayed away, and just some dusty metal from the use of the cable when you're riding the bike. So. You want to clean out that housing, make it really clean inside there. You might want to sand off the end of your bar. And also, take a look at your throttle housings. Take off the grip, or if your grip is ripped and you're going to replace it, take a look at the throttle housings and make sure that they're in good condition. The next time try this segment is brought to you by Vinco. Keep the ride going. I love that sound. In the Moto Showcase tonight, we've got something very, very interesting for you. I was at the International Motocross Museum a couple of weeks ago, and with the approval of Terry Good, we uh, are going to show you a very interesting bike tonight, formerly ridden by Marty Smith. So, Jordan, we'll uh, roll the tape right now. Let's see what we got. I'm at the International Motocross Museum fundraiser in Chicago, and one of the bikes that immediately caught my eye was this 1976 Honda Type 2. It was named a Type 2 with good reason. It was a totally different bike than the one Marty Smith had raced in 1974 and 75, which earned him two number one plates. While the Tahitian red paint was the same, little else was a carryover from the previous bike. The engine in this bike weighed a slim 28 pounds and featured sand cast magnesium cases and a five-speed transmission. All the gears and internal components were machined by hand. The frame, shock position, and suspension travel were all new and improved as well. This is one of two bikes that was raced by Marty in late 76 in Japan. Then, after those races, it was stored until 2007 when this one was purchased by Terry Good. The second one is in the Honda Museum, also in Japan. The bike is incredible to see in person, and the details in design are amazing. From the knurled forks to the titanium fasteners to the unmistakable shape of the gas tank, there was nothing quite like an RC125 Type 2. This particular bike was only raced three times in the USA and was uncrated the day before the Delta Ohio race. With all the exotic materials and components on the bike, it was shipped without Marty's number one on it. With little time to spare, the story goes that Dave Arnold bought some black contact paper and made the numbers himself just before the race. This 125 was blindingly fast, and at one point during the Delta race, Marty held a 14-second lead over Bob Hanna and the rest of the pack. To learn more about the RC125 Type 2, visit mxworksbikes.com. I'd like to thank Terry Good and the International Motocross Museum for allowing us to feature this bike on Vintage Motocross Q&A. We'll also have some pictures of that bike on our Facebook page, Vintage Motocross Q&A. Now, 
That segment was, of course, sponsored by Preston Petty. And this week, the Preston Petty special is two fenders, a front and a rear in silver, along with three number plates, $122.50. Just $122.50, you jazz up your bike with some Preston Petty products. Visit them online at PrestonPetty.com. And here's the problem segment tonight. We take a look at some of the questions that you've sent in. And we also have a tip this week. And I'm going to share that with you right now. Jordan, what's the first thing that we have up? James Costable sent in a great tip. If anyone likes to run a 36 millimeter Makuni on their 1974 Honda CR250, this is the air boot you need to use. It's a Boltaco air boot and the part number is 143.15166. And James Costable showed us a picture of this too. It looks really, well, looks perfectly at home on that Makuni carburetor sitting on a 1974 Honda CR250. And there it is, you've got the part number. He says he bought his at Hughes Boltaco, but most any Boltaco dealer, aftermarket dealer or guys that are reproducing Boltaco parts will have that. Boltaco air boot for your Honda CR250 if you wanna run a Makuni carburetor. Thanks, James. Sal Scarpa, I need to match my paint on a Kajiva on his, on his pipe and it's a great color. Does anyone match paint in a spray can and make it heat resistant. You know, it took me a little while to find out if this uh, this was available, Sal, but I did locate a company called G2, G2. They have a website and uh, I don't know if they have a Facebook page, but I easily found them at uh, g2usa.com. And they do make heat resistant paint in a can in any color you want. They show it on brake calipers, which can get quite hot. So if you can, uh, if you can get them maybe uh, uh, a picture of your pipe or tell them what color gray you're looking for, they will be able to match it up and it will be heat resistant. Thanks for the question, Sal Scarpa. Rick Torres, I'm restoring several XR and XL minis from 1973 to 1978. Where can I get steel sprockets for them? Sometimes dealers still have some in stock, but if you want something a little bit different or you're finding that dealers are completely sold out, you can go to a place called Rebel Gears. Rebel Gears. They have a, uh, a website, rebelgears.com, and they also are really, really helpful when you call. I've had to get sprockets made there before, and it's nice to be able to call somebody and somebody pick up the phone and you could actually get some personalized customer service. But they're in Crossville, Tennessee, and they'll make you a steel sprocket to match your Honda sprockets, Rick, and they'll also make them a little bit bigger if you like too. So whatever size you have, if you want to go up a tooth, or two or three, or maybe a little bit smaller, they'll make them any size you want. Rebel Gears. Crossville, Tennessee. This is Scott Burworth, and you're watching. <laughs> this is Scott Burworth, and you're watching Vintage MX. This is Scott Burworth. You... <laughs> Hi, I'm Debbie Burworth. You're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A. Don't forget, SoCal Vintage MX Classic coming up. We'll be right back. Hi guys, Brandon here with Motion Pro, bringing to you the world's first non-leaking cable luber. You heard me right, non-leaking cable luber. Motion Pro has designed a very ingenious tool. It's very simple to use. There's two halves and a rubber grommet that seals the canister around the cable. By connecting the two halves together, you create a compression fit. Now once that's tight, you insert the straw for your cable lube. Of course, I'm going to recommend Motion Pro's very best cable lube. Um, you insert the straw in the end of the cable luber. You fill the fluid into the canister. And there's nowhere else for the fluid to go but into the cable. It's quick, it's clean, it's affordable at $19.99, available from your retailers nationwide. Motion Pro Cable Luber V3, get it today. Keep your cables fresh. In tonight, What's It Worth segment, which is brought to you by Full Circle Racing, we take a look at a 1977 OSA 250 in a champion frame. It's a really beautiful bike. I'm going to read to you about the details, and I'm going to, well, I'm feeling a little generous tonight. Let me say this. This, of course, is the part of the show where we encourage you to type in what you think this bike recently sold for. As I said, I'm feeling a little generous, so I'll tell you this. Start your guessing over $8,500. It went for over $8,500. I'll read to you about the details 
Jordan will go through the slide and you could tell us what you think this bike recently sold for. It's an extremely rare, highly original, correct 1977 vintage champion framed OSA ST1250 flat track racing bike. Extremely correct restoration was done by an old time OSA restoration guru and collector. Many original hard to find parts like the mechanical rear dish caliper with the banana caliper hanger, Siriani road race forks with the dirt track triple clamps, beautiful S&W rear shocks, champion tank and seat makes. Approximately only 50 of these bikes have ever been made. I'm guessing maybe very few still exist. Could be even more than the Dick Man replicas. This is a no reserve auction. It's generally, I would call it a show quality bike. I'd say it's a nine out of scale of nine to 10. Some of the older rubber parts are starting to show a little cracking. The frame and the motor look to be in excellent condition. The frame number is OSA 2025. As far as I know, they all start with the prefix 20. Motor number is 4608. Tires look to be NOS and are in great condition. This is for the serious flat track or OSA collector. It would likely be the nicest bike in your collection. It is sold on a bill of sale and I will ship worldwide. If you looked at those pictures as I was reading the description, this guy's not kidding. It was a beautiful bike and it is a very rare champion frame. So what do you think it sold for? Remember, I told you it went for over 8,500, 9,500, 10,000. $10,595, $10,595. And uh, well, I, I think that was, uh, well, I think it's a really, really special bike. And I think it's a really good price for, for a champion frame OSA flat tracker, just like that. Did you get close? Did you get close without going over? We'll take a look a little bit later on and I'll, I'll see what your estimates were. That segment of course was brought to you by Full Circle Racing. Tom McAllister still run a great special up there. He will powder coat your hub, strip them, bead blast them, powder coat them, change the bearings if you like for just 50 bucks a hub, $10 more for the backing plate. That is of course in satin black or a gloss finish. If you want it in a custom color, Tom will do that for you too. Be sure, you will, be sure to get a hold of Tom McAllister at Full Circle Racing. Have you ever heard of, have you ever heard of an Emmy? An Emmy R100. This is a really, really interesting bike that I got a chance to see in person at the Barber Museum down in Alabama a while ago. But I want to read to you about it and we'll go through the slides. The Emmy R100 was a lightweight motorcycle made by Rydell AG from 1948 to 1951. It is noted for its simple yet innovative design with many, many advanced features. With low cost technical innovation, the R100 sold well, but reliability issues really hurt them and it profit margins as well and it resulted from the warranty cost. Now, the R100 was one of the motorcycles that was included in the Art of Motorcycles exhibit at the Guggenheim Museum in 1998, and this particular bike is now on permanent display at the Barber Museum. Motorcycle engineer Norbert Reidel recognized the need for a simple, economical, lightweight motorcycle during Germany's recovery from the Second World War, and he began to produce this bike by 1947. And it was built, it was tested, and it was looking really good. This was a piston port, two stroke, single cylinder engine of just 99 cc. The engine was cast in a light alloy around the cylinder liner and it had an integral cylinder head. The crankshaft was suspended on one side of the cases. Power output for this engine was just 4.5 horsepower. The transmission was a three speed, but it was an automatic and it had a mechanism in it that would just completely stop the bike, much like your Honda Mini Trails a, bit, uh, a bit later on, but it was an automatic. The engine and transmission were mounted together just on the swing arm in front of the pivot axle in the center of the frame. The MER 100's lightweight, relatively powerful engine and long travel suspension made it very, very popular in motorsports. This with uh, good marketing and low pricing, it was really attractive, but the management at Rydell did not expect to have so many returns on their warranties and eventually they suffered greatly. And in 1950, Rydell AG went bankrupt to the tune of 1.25 million Deutschmarks. Well, it is an amazing little bike. I did see it in person. It's incredible how the exhaust is actually part of the swing arm, how the engine pivots on the front. You've got to take a closer look at this bike, or if you ever get a chance to get down to uh, the Barber Museum, you check out this, uh, this Emmy R100. Sunrise Vapor Blasting. You've heard me talk about Mark Ferriester and Sunrise Vapor Blasting here on the show. I send him stuff all the time. It comes back really, really quickly and really perfectly. So if you've got something delicate for your motorcycle, 
plane, boat, train, whatever it may be. You get it over to Mark Farias. They're in Modesto. He's got a great turnaround time, and his prices are exceptionally fair. When he puts it into that machine, it comes out cleaner than new, doesn't change the profile of the metal. And if you have any brass fittings or a dissimilar metal attached to your part, it's not going to damage it. It's going to come back better than new. Thank you, Mark Farriester and Sunrise Vapor Blasting. I'm looking forward to seeing Mark this weekend at the NorCal reunion. We're going to take a commercial break. Don't forget to keep sharing the show. We are going to have a random share giveaway winner, but we're not going to announce it on the show tonight. You'll have to go to Vintage Motocross Q&A tomorrow. Check on the page to see who won this nice decal sticker sheet compliment to Vinco. We'll be right back. Classic and vintage dirt bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life and doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. Vinco, keep the ride going. This Week in Motocross History is brought to you by Racer X Magazine, one of the finest publications on your newsstand and online. Don't forget to see our ad in the back of Racer X. It was 1970, and if you're looking for the very first AMA motocross ever sanctioned by the association as part of a series, this is it, the opening round of the brand new Trans AMA series held in LaRue, Ohio. At the time, Edson Dye's Inter-Am series was already well established, but Dye did not have the AMA sanction, so he could have full control of the series that he had found, actually. The AMA finally decided to start doing its own series, and the Trans-AMA Tour was born. Unlike the Husqvarna-dominated Inter-Am Series, the Trans-Am Series brought out 500 stars like former world champion Jeff Smith of Great Britain and his BSA teammates, John Banks and Dave Nickel. Smith turned out to be the overall winner, followed by Swedish transplant Gunnar Lindstrom, Nickel, and Vickers. The top American was fifth place Bob Thompson. An interesting note, for some reason, the fastest American at that time, CZ rider Brad Lackey was relegated to the support class, which he dominated. And he did get the cover of Cycle News that week, Brad Lackey. It was 1976, and it's five in a row for the man. Another year, another Trans Am at Unadilla, another win for Roger DeCoster. No track in the United States was better suited for the man, and DeCoster would win five straight years in a row at Ward Robinson's upstate New York facility. It was a stark contrast to Roger's relationship with Carlsbad, where the 500cc USGP was held, where DeCoster never actually won. Finishing second at Unadilla was the man who dominated Carlsbad the same way Roger dominated Unadilla. It was Garrett Walsink. However, after the race, AMA referee Ron Denny docked Walsink one lap for riding outside of the boundaries, dropping him to 14th. Second on the day was Kawasaki's Gary Semix on a Husqvarna. We talked about the first trans AMA race. Now we're going to talk about the last one. The dubious distinction is 1982. And in 82, the last ever trans USA race was held at, you guessed it, Unadilla. The winner was Kawasaki's Billy Lyles, who hailed from Georgia. Lyles went 1-1-3 one, one, and three to top Mako mounted Mickey Kessler, who went 3-2-1 and one in the three-moto format and holds the distinction of being the last man to ever win a moto in that once grand series. As for the championship title, that would go to fourth place Davey Hollis, a privateer on a Suzuki. Hard to believe that just four years before, this series was still attracted to the likes of Roger DeCoster and Garrett Walsink, who I just mentioned earlier, some of the fastest Europeans of all time. But that was it. In 1982, the last Trans-USA race was held at Unadilla and won by Billy Lyles. The announcement segment brought to you by Golan Products. You've been hearing me talk about Golan Industries for a while now. They make this beautiful filter. It's made of billet aluminum, comes in silver, blue, orange, and red. It can be cleaned indefinitely, and they make them for all types of bikes. Adventure bikes, mini, off-road, you name it, this filter will fit. It can be cleaned indefinitely on the trail, in your driveway. It's the last filter you're ever going to buy. Costs a couple of bucks more because it works better than anything that's ever been made previous to it. 
They could go in the streets, and I know they're still looking for representatives. Get a hold of them at goldenpro at yahoo.com. Vintage Motocross Radio, no show this week. I'll be down at the NorCal reunion. I'll be reporting some things live right here to Vintage Motocross Q&A. But we are working on some interviews for the future. One of them will be, of course, Vic Krause. And uh, I did speak to Ricky Johnson and Brian Myerskoff and a few other people. So we'll be setting things, some things up for some really good interviews for you. Um, could be toward the end of October, more than likely in November. But don't forget, all of our interviews, over 50 of them, can all be seen uh, or listened to on our podcast, too. Not only on Facebook and on YouTube, but on our own podcast channels. Here's Vic Krause, Mr. Know-It-All. On a sad note from Southern California, Andy Delatore, a man who helped so many people in the 70s get started in racing through his uh, shop, Mid Valley, passed away last week. We want to uh, extend our condolences to the Delatore family and uh, just to mention a few names of some of the people they helped coming up through the ranks. Uh, it was Kenny Zart, Marty Moach, Donnie Hansen, um, so many, so many more that I, uh, I could go on and on how generous these people really were. We do want to give our condolences to the Delatore family. You heard Debbie Burnworth talking about it just a few moments ago. It's here this weekend, the SoCal Vintage Fall Classic down at Glen Helen, the second annual running of the Marty Smith Memorial Cup. Get down there and support Debbie and Scott Burnworth. They do so much for the sport of vintage motocross. And there's a class for everybody there too, from minis to uh, modern bikes and of course, all the vintage classes. Go and get some vintage motocrossing this weekend at Glen Helen. Ah. My friend Al Roof wanted me to mention this, the Chillicote Enduro Riders. They got a great event coming up October 16th and 17th down there in uh, Chillicote, Ohio. So they've got motocross, vintage motocross. I think they have a cross country. This is a two-day event, October 16th and 17th. So you can go to the, uh, Cali- the, um, the Chillicote Enduro Riders page on Facebook if you want to learn more about it, when the sign-up is and what the classes are a little bit more definitively. But I want to thank Al Roof for sending me that and hope everybody has a great time out there at Camp Cattail this weekend. Uh, Langston Motorsports, they've got the fifth annual Vintage Motorcycle Show coming up on the 23rd of October. I will be the MC. I'll be there all day. In the past years, they've had 150, 175 bikes. From what Grant Langston tells me, they're expecting over 200 bikes this year. Marty Tripes will probably be there, Donnie Hanson, Rex State, and, and a lot of other legendary riders and industry professionals. So I hope you could join me at Langston Motorsports the 23rd of October from 9 a.m. till 2 in the afternoon. Oktoberfest that's coming up on Halloween, October 31st. Tammy Greenhill putting on another great event along with Arma down at Glen Helen. They've got a clash for just about everybody. And don't forget, due to the generosity of Rod Lake Racing, kids always ride for free. Thank you, Tammy. And thank you, Rod Lake. The finish line tonight is sponsored by Northwest Mako CZ. Get over to their website. This week's special is a twin air filter for your Mako. Just $34.95. $34.95 this week at Northwest Mako CZ. British Motocross Q&A t-shirts and hoodies are still available, gray and white. I understand from Jordan that the uh, hoodies are doing pretty well this time of year. So follow the link in the show description for just $19.99. You can get a t-shirt and for just a couple of bucks more, you get one of those nice toasty hoodies. VMX Q&A sponsorship opportunities are still available. Get a hold of me. I'll get your sponsorship proposal package. Believe me, it's much more affordable than you think. You'll be seeing the same benefits as Motion Pro, Preston Petty Products, Vinco, and everybody else on the board behind me. Some of them have been with me close to two years now, and um, we're growing. We're, we're hitting over 20,000 people a week. Uh, we hit over 70,000 people last month. That's on Facebook, uh, more on YouTube. And yes, you did hear me mention at the end of the show last week that we will be on a television station in New York. We're still hammering out some of the details. There will be an announcement about that coming up on a show in the very near future. But that is it for tonight for Vintage Motocross Q&A. What's that? I don't know. I'll try. Let's see what happens. Gino! Gino and Rocco! I enjoyed bringing it to you. Don't forget, no radio show this weekend. 
Um, I'll be down at the NorCal Classic this weekend in uh, Santa Cruz. And hey, come on, boys. Oh, come on. Oh, there you go. oh good boy, Gino. Come on. Come on. Come on, Rocco. There you go, Rocco.